Imagine that you are looking in the refrigerator for mustard. Mm, mustard. And then you close the fridge and your roommate says, do we have any mayo? Do you know? You probably don't know. You have to look again. And it could be right there. It was right next to the mustard. Your eyes captured that image, but your brain didn't process it. So to some extent, we all inhabit different realities, right? Your roommate could look in that fridge and because they're focusing on the mayo, they see the mayo and not the mustard. You, on the other hand, see the mustard and not the mayo. You are inhabiting different realities. The objective reality of the fact that the mustard and the mayo are both there is not the one that matters to you as an individual. What matters is how your brain processes that information. So that's what we're talking about today is the perception process and how it interacts with the communication process. We're going to talk about the steps in the perception process, how the process works, what this means for communication, and finally, a skill called perception checking that allows us to take our newfound knowledge of perception and use that to improve our communication skills. So let's talk first about the steps in the process. According to the October 2017 issue of the journal Studies in Literature and Language, there are three steps in the perception process, selection, organization, and interpretation. The way I remember this is it spells soy, S-O-I, so kind of spells soy. <laughs> so according to these steps in the process, the first one is selection. So you're surrounded. The world is full of all kinds of stimuli that you could pay attention to, but that would, that would just be overwhelming. We are not able to do that. We can't process at that level. So instead, our brains just kind of filter a lot of stuff out, and we only select certain things to pay attention to. Now, there are some universals in terms of what we choose to pay attention to. For example, most of us will pay attention to something that is repetitive. It's as it repeats, it kind of drills its way into our brain. That's why in public speaking, we say, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, because that repetition helps us to perceive and process the information. So we're, we're more likely to select that information and save it in our memory. Another thing that influences whether we select something to pay attention to is the intensity of it. So this is why alarms have bright flashing lights and a, and a really intense sound. This is why the emergency broadcast system goes <coughs> because that repetition causes us to select it to pay attention to and that intensity causes us to select that to pay attention to. And they knew it was really important that everybody select that to pay attention to and, and not block it out, right? So they, they used their knowledge of how perception works in order to make it more effective. So yeah, that's the selection process. And we all, some of it is universal, but some of it is different. So we all have differences in how we perceive things. I perceive the mustard, you perceive the mayonnaise. I perceive somebody's sense of humor, you perceive how intelligent they are. Um, so we all are kind of walking through different realities We because our perception shapes how we view reality. So now that we've selected information to pay attention to or stimuli to pay attention to, we have to organize it. Our brains are constantly trying to impose order on the chaos. We are looking for patterns. We are imposing patterns. If they didn't exist, we are trying to make sense of the chaos. So we organize. So to use my earlier example, if you meet somebody and you are focusing on sense of humor, you might also be aware of intelligence, but for you, it's sense of humor and then intelligence, right? So in, ter in terms of organization, that's how you're prioritizing. That's your pattern. Sense of humor comes first, then intelligence, then let's say kindness, how kind they are. Well, you might have a friend who focuses first on intelligence and then kindness and then sense of humor. So if you say, hey, you know, I met so-and-so at the party the other day, and they'll say, oh yeah, they're actually a really nice person. And you're like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. I just noticed that they had a really good sense of humor. So you both met the same person, but you filed them in the filing system in your brain a little bit differently because the way you organize your reality is different from how your friend organizes their reality. 
In addition to trying to impose order on the chaos, we all also try to interpret our world. We naturally try to assign meaning or figure out what the meaning is. And that is going to influence how we perceive the world. So if you generally, your interpretation tends to include the idea that a particular kind of car is a bad car. Well, you may not even notice that car driving down the street just fine, but if you happen to see one of those cars at the side of the road with their hood up, you're going to say, see, those are bad cars. And if you happen to be riding with a friend who doesn't have that particular interpretation in their brain, then they might not even have noticed what kind of car that was. They just noticed that it was a car with the hood up. So again, even though there is an objective reality, that kind of car is at the side of the road with the hood up you interpret that as evidence that that kind of car is a bad car, but they just interpret it as somebody's having car trouble. And remember, you saw 20 examples of that car driving just fine down the highway, but you didn't select those to pay attention to because of the way your brain is already predisposed to interpret the world. So that object of reality is getting dismissed by your brain. Now, that's a pretty good segue, I think, into talking more specifically about how the perception process works. The psychological dimension has more influence on our perception than our physical senses. So even though your eyes saw the, the mustard or the mayonnaise, yeah, your eyes saw the mayonnaise, but didn't perceive it, your brain didn't process it. Your eyes saw that car driving down this, the road plenty of times, just fine. But that's not what influenced your perception. What influenced your perception was the psychology of it. I'm focused on mustard. Mustard is more important to me than mayonnaise. Or I'm focused on the broken down car because that fits my preconceived notions about that car. According to The Perception of Quality by Kenyon and Sen, these stages are intertwined. So it's not step-by-step, step, select, organize, interpret. It's more like how you interpret the world influences what you select in the first place and how you organize it. And how you organize it influences your interpretation and influences your selection. So it's not step-by-step, step, it's more of, of a big tangle. They're all intertwined. So what does this mean for communication? Well, obviously, if we're all inhabiting different realities to some extent, that's going to influence how we communicate. We think we're on the same page, but we are not necessarily on the same page. So let's say, for example, we have a parent with a teenager. And actually, let's not talk about skill, the perception checking skill quite yet. Let's talk about communication some more. So we have a parent with a 15-year-old. And the parent watches their 15 year old walk across their bedroom and literally step over the dirty clothes on the floor. Now, what's the parent gonna think? They're gonna think their teenager is being a lazy slob. Right? They're being lazy and sloppy. The clothes are right there, bend down, pick them up, put them in your hamper. But think about what it's like to be 15. I think sometimes Parents forget this. When you're 15, you've got a lot going on in your brain. You're like, I got a biology test to study for, mitosis, meiosis, the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell, right? <laughs> you've, got, you've got that going on. You're thinking, oh, you know, there's somebody in my biology class that is cute. I wonder if they think I'm cute. Oh, band practice. Oh, you know what? I need to start applying for jobs. Oh, I got to start applying for college. Oh, pretty soon I get to learn how to drive. There's a lot going on, right? So as you are stepping across the, the dirty laundry, your brain perceives it subconsciously enough for you to step over it, but not consciously. You are not consciously aware of that laundry. And if the parent goes, what are you doing stepping over the dirty laundry? Just bend over and pick it up. You're going to have to literally look down and be like, oh, yeah, there is laundry there. Like, <laughs> you did not know it was there. So as the parent is trying to communicate with you, it's a good it's a good thing to be aware that we're inhabiting different worlds. You're in the world with the biology test and the, the cute person in your biology class and driver's tests and college applications and all kinds of stuff. They're in the world where you have dirty clothes on your floor. So as the parent, it's going to help if you can use perception checking. Perception checking is the skill where you are trying to check and see if you're on the same page that the other person is with your perceptions. Now, the first step in the skill is to clearly describe the behavior you're talking about. So if you're talking to your 15 year old, you wouldn't say you're being such a lazy slob. They're not going to know what you're talking about. 
Instead, you would need to say, hey, you just walked across your room, stepped over their dirty clothes and didn't put them in your hamper. And then the teenager can look down and say, oh, yeah, I actually did do that. <laughs> so you have to, first of all, clearly, concretely describe the behavior that you're talking about. Then you provide two possible interpretations. So teenager of mine, I've noticed that you just walked across your bedroom and stepped over the dirty clothes and didn't put them in your hamper. It could be that you've just got a lot on your mind and you didn't even see the dirty clothes, or it could be that, yeah, you saw them, but you just don't feel like putting them in the hamper. What's going on there? And that what's going on there is the third step in the process where you request clarification. You don't say, which is it? Because it might be some third thing that you don't know about. Maybe they are processing in their mind how they want to do their laundry before they put it in the hamper. Maybe they're going to create three hampers, one for lights, one for darks, and one for reds. Who knows? So you, when you request clarification, you don't just say, which one is it? You say, what's going on? So that's it. That's the skill. Describe the behavior, provide two possible interpretations, and that way you're not just defaulting to your instinctive assumption, right? You're taking a step back and being a little bit more empathetic and thinking what else could be going on. And then that third step is just request clarification and you just ask what's going on. So we have talked about the steps in the perception process, how the process works, how it's all intertwined, what that means for communication, that we can't just assume that we're all interpreting the world the same way and existing in the same reality. We have to communicate about that. And finally, the perception checking skill, which is a way to communicate about that. We do experience the world differently. One of the benefits of communication is being able to share our realities with each other.